Hi, and welcome back to episode four of The Star Report. My fourth guest is Melissa Diop, who is a skilled garment technologist that has worked with an array of brands and is definitely an expert in her field. I first came across Melissa in my fashion designing days that were definitely short-lived, but that is when I met her, so I thought, why not take a contact that I met a couple of years ago and bring her to share all her insight. I was enrolled onto this program called Fad Futures, and one can say Melissa was a kind of lecturer on the course. The course was about constructing and designing garments, and of course, with Melissa being a garment technologist, she was teaching us all about the intricacies of creating a garment. Melissa was a great teacher on that program and our working together didn't end there as we worked on a Black Lives Matter project together after, which was amazing. Melissa is now very senior in her role and has moved on to do bigger and better things, but she had her time interning, so it would only make sense for her to share her journey. In today's episode, myself and Melissa will discuss her early life, landing internships, deciding to become a garment technologist when there are so many other fashion roles out there, the brand she has worked with and how each one differs, as well as some advice on how to pave a lane for yourself. Now to top it all off, we will be doing the Star Report special of Drab or Fab. I appreciate every single person who takes the time to listen and please leave feedback or a review as I would love to hear what you think. Be sure to follow the podcast at The Star Report for episode updates and our social media at The Star Report on all platforms for fashion fun. Hi, Melissa. Welcome to the Star Report. Hello, hello. Would you like to start by introducing yourself and telling us like what it is you do within the industry? Okay, so hi, my name is Melissa. Um, I was previously a garment tech for about five, six years, spanning across menswear and womenswear um, and in different parts of the industry. So in the retail side of things, as well as the supply side of things. Um, I now currently run a workspace for creatives. So that is with the Trampery at Poplar Works, where we have over f- almost 30 designers um, within our workspaces. So it is quite creative and I oversee a lot of fashion businesses. So it's so funny because a garment technologist is like crucial to every garment ever made practically. Yeah. But for those that don't know, like what does a garment technologist really do? Like what is... What is a garment technologist? So I think everyone always um, looks into a fashion designer or a buyer as the main roles within fashion and don't realise that there's other things uh, within the fashion industry. So, for example, myself um, as a garment technologist, I sit between the designer and a buyer in a retail space. Um, Get the best of both worlds. Yeah, quite, quite rarely so. I don't necessarily have to be super, super creative um to design all of these crazy things but then I have to think quite logically in how um for example which seams go where and where the zip goes uh how will it affect the fit uh how will pockets affect a fit or something like that so I have to make sure that the design of a garment fits its function so what would a garment technologist be responsible for, like within the workplace? So like yep. your responsibilities kind of, what were they? So my responsibilities would be to run fit sessions. Um, and that was my main priority is to make sure all the samples were in at the right time and just to check that they fit on the fit model. Um, this, So a designer and buyer or and myself would be in that fit session just to talk about all the things that, for example, fit, um, the quality of the fabric, how it drapes, um, what else? If there's if there's anything that needs to be changed on the pattern, for example, and sometimes occasionally what, yeah, any changes that could be made as well. Great. So obviously you work in fashion. Mm. Has it always been fashion you wanted to work in, or was there like something different before? Not necessarily. I I kind of fell into fashion as, yeah, by accident. So when I was in my final years of A-levels, I thought I was going to go into um, doing languages and I didn't end up going to the university that I wanted to. So I searched for um, courses near me and found a bespoke tailoring course um, that was free for under 21s at the time. However, it had affiliations to Savile Row, which was really, really exciting um, because there wasn't any th- 
something like that at the time. So it was the same course that, for example, Alexander McQueen did. Yeah. Um, and quite a lot of the tailors that I admired at that time um, did that same course. Uh, I ended up doing it because I really, really wanted to get into the actual technicalities of making clothes. So not just the whole, I'm going to design this and hopefully kind of mash it up somehow. <laughs> um, I really wanted to know how a product was made end to end and that whole process. So I think bespoke tailoring really, really helped set that out. And although I was making clothes for men, I was also able to use the techniques I learned into my own creations as well. That makes perfect sense. So would you decide for yourself as a more analytical thinker or a more like doing kind of Yeah, yeah. Thing? So I think the reason why I became a garment tech and kind of fell into it was because I really, really enjoyed that side of things. Okay. I didn't really care about the design of anything. I, I hated that part of it. <laughs> I just wanted to create. But I, you can I really yeah, yeah, but I I think it takes a lot more time to find that whole inspiration. I, I kind of found the design process really jarring. Oh, So, you know, the whole, I have to go research this, I have to go and do a mood board, I have to, you know, it just felt all la 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 la. Yeah. I really wanted to just get on with it. Like execute, you yeah, want yeah, execution. Yeah, so for example, I was able to see when when we finally got into the whole pattern cutting side of things, being able to take a flat piece of paper and turn it into a 3D shape really, really excited me. And just being able to actually, you know, figure out what seams work best. So you have so many kinds of seams, like you have a flat seam, which you find on jeans or um, like little on satin dresses if it's a good satin dress mind you if it's a good satin dress if it's a good if it's a good really well made dress you'll <laughs> have you'll have it properly made with um really really nice seams inside Melissa are you throwing shade heck yeah um <laughs> we see a lot of crap on the high street and yeah a lot of things aren't properly made so but I guess it's because everything has to be done really really quickly and that's also part of my job too I have to make sure I have to say, okay, how quickly do you want this? The quality will go down, but if you want it ASAP, then that's what we'll have to do. Okay. Something has to give. Yeah. So, like, that's interesting, obviously. So, what was your early life like? Like, your life as a child slash adolescent? What was it like? Mm, so, I grew up in different countries. I was born in Madrid, and then I was I moved to the Philippines um, before coming into the UK. And in Madrid, there's this whole... Um, lifestyle of you know you don't want to go outside in your pajamas so even I think this is the first time that I saw this was when I was I moved to the UK and people go into the shops in their pajamas or like their bathrobes or things like that so I was Guilty. really really confused really confused I would remember my grandmother or mother going oh my god you need to change um so I think that that kind of carried on throughout the rest of my youth and now as well it's just I don't really want to be it, it sounds that it sounds so crazy to say I don't want to be seen dead in a really naff outfit, basically. <laughs> so you know, first impressions count, um, and that's that's what I always believe. So yeah, y you know, y you have those days where you wear you you feel like crap, and you know you look like crap, um, and then something happens, like you see someone that you really really like, or you know you meet someone then you're like oh dang I wish I looked a little bit better, better. so that or looked a bit more presentable yeah. so that I don't look so much of a mess so th yeah things like that I've learned my lesson many a time and yeah definitely none of that <laughs> so how are your family about you like wanting to work in the fashion route are they like really supportive or did they more want you to take a conventional route um I think because I was not taking a conventional route I I was doing a I wasn't going into university. I chose, I decided to go to the course that I did uh, two weeks before I was supposed to enroll for my course at university. Um, and it took a lot of thinking, but I, well, the thinking was more to do with how my parents were going to react. I knew in my heart that I was going to do it, um, but it took some time. So, you know, with Asian parents, it was always like, oh my God, you're not going to be to be a lawyer, you're not going to be a doctor, you're not going to be this, that, and the other. And 
I had to convince my dad first, who absolutely loved the idea of me doing this, just because I, I kind of explained to him, you know, everyone needs clothes. There's always going to be a job for me. Um, and also the, the kind of prospect of him being able to have a um, ready-made suit, because literally he is a really, really... Uh, he's built like a teapot. He's short and stout. Um, and it's really, really hard to find clothes. So mm -hmm. that's what tailoring is for. It's for really, really well-made, really well, like really great quality clothes that make yeah. you feel great. Yeah. And especially when it's tailored to you, it makes such a difference. So, um, yeah, being able to convince him that way was um, really, really great. My mum, on the other hand, still asks me to this day when I'm going to university. So there's that difference between them. There's a big contrast. Yeah, there. yeah. Um, although she has seen me, and she, and it's really funny when she talks to her friends, and she, and I hear her talk about my career. She's like, "Oh my god, Melissa works in fashion. It's great. Um, she meets these designers all the time. You know, she works for these big brands. She probably designed that." And I'm like, "Mom, I'm not a designer, but." Yeah, that's that's what she does. Yeah, it's nice though when your parents like boast about you. Like my mom does it too. I love it. Yeah, it really good. but then it's really strange because then I'll come home and it's like, why, why are you in your pajamas and why do you not do anything around the house? And then when, you know, when they're out and about, they're just singing your praises all the time. So yeah, it's strange. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so fashion is very vast, and like mm. obviously you kind of touched on it, mm. but like people feel like it's important to know like what they need to study before they get into certain paths and not every path has like a conventional route like you meet lots of people within the fashion industry that have studied an array of things yeah so what did you kind of so you said you went you studied bespoke tailoring so where was that and like what was so it like? that was that was at Newham College um and that was a level one and level two bespoke tailoring course it was quite so the actual name for it is almost apparel construction and something like that but it was the course that I specifically did was really, really tailored. It pardon the pun, but really tailored to tailoring. Um, whereas other places, they just teach you how to sew on a skirt or sew a t-shirt or something like that. Um, and then I felt, and then I f was looking for apprenticeships at the time that I was, um, I was studying as a tailor because to be a bespoke tailor, you have to train. Um, at least five to six years before you can even make your own jackets for clients and oh things like gosh. that because of the amount of handwork that it takes. Yeah. So, for example, just to make a suit would take about 50 to 80 hours worth of handwork. Um, oh. So you've got to do a lot of hand stitching and you've got to kind of have a feel for the fabric and how it shapes and things like that. So that's that's why I was looking for an apprenticeship. But the thing is, at the same time, I needed a job. So um, I found an apprenticeship at Marks and Spencer's um, for an apprentice garment tech. And I didn't really know what a garment tech was at that, that time, but I realized I really like the whole functionality side of things. And I like, so I thought I would try it out. And yeah, just because of my previous knowledge of fabrics and actual garment construction and things like that, they during the interview, they really, really liked me. So I managed to be able to, get onto this two-year apprenticeship um, to become a garment tech. Now, apprenticeships are so low level, like in terms of salary. Um, and it's really, really great when you're younger to be able to do it. Yeah. Um, that's why a lot of older people aren't able to do so much because it is quite a, a shocking amount of money. Yeah. Um, at the time, so this was in 2016 and this was about... I, I was paid three pounds fifty an hour. Three pound what? Three pound fifty. So <coughs> yeah, no. yeah. So exactly. And imagine now it's better, but that price is still about five pounds or four pounds fifty per hour. But the reason why is because they say that they are also paying for your education. Yeah. Yeah. So whilst I did my apprenticeship, I also studied level three garment technology. Uh, well, it was pretty much the same course, apparel, pro apparel production or something similar, whatever the name is. But it was more on the theory side of things um, and all about health and safety and factories and all of this. It was quite a lot of coursework. Um, but people can 
do a degree in garment technology um, or sometimes they decide to do fashion design and technology um, as a combined degree. Um, other ways to get into uh, garment technology, funnily enough, is also architecture. Really? Um, just because you can, as as um, I've had some colleagues who have done that, or and most people tend to do a design degree yeah. and get into it that way. Um, you can also do apparel product development as well. Um, but yeah, the possibilities are endless. Uh, sometimes you end up starting as an garment tech assi admin assistant and work your way up just by learning and observing those fit sessions yeah. yeah so do you feel like in that year at Newham College that you did because most that was that like after that was after sixth form then yeah that did was did you find it really intense like a year is a short amount of time to learn how to tailor was it an intense course so yeah uh, I mean the course was spread out over three years but you could do two so I did about two years and I, I didn't really find it quite intense mainly because you were focused on just tailoring the entire time. You didn't have, I mean, like college or actual, for example, like when you do your GCSEs, you have to juggle so many subjects at yeah. one time. I felt like because we spent so many days and hours together and learning how to do one thing over and over again, it felt like I had to build almost muscle memory yeah. whilst doing that. Um, and after the first few months, it just got easier and easier. You, you set yourself a routine. Um, it's, it's basically like if you were making clothes for ages. So you kind of have a set routine. You know what you're doing. You, yeah. iron, you iron your fabric first. You make sure that all your like pins are ready and things like that. And you've got all the bobbins that you need. So, yeah, it, yeah, it was almost quite therapeutic, actually. So obviously, like, you've said all the ways that you can do it, like, through a school system. Mm. If someone's not really into the whole, like, education side and mm. they can't kind of wait to be done with it, do you think there's... You said the thing about the apprenticeship. Yeah. Obviously, apprenticeships don't always require you to have, like, a university... Don't require you to have, like, a university yeah, degree. Yeah, so apprenticeships obviously. don't... So you shouldn't have an, a, a university degree when okay. you do an apprenticeship. Um, the reason why is because it is lower than... So the grade is lower than a degree. Okay. Um, so, for example, like, university degrees are level six or above um and usually the you can do a degree apprenticeship and the um the company will pay for your degree so that is really really interesting but for more fashion and creative industries it's it's normally a level three qualification okay level three or level four um so yeah Apprenticeships are a really, really great way to go into it, yeah. mainly because y you will have the experience of someone who has already graduated by the end of your um, by the end of your apprenticeship. Amazing. So everyone who has graduated will still be waiting on their first job in the industry. Yeah. And you would have already had two years or one year's worth of experience. Yeah. Um, I, f I realized this when I went. I went and looked for jobs as like a, as my next step up after the admin assistant role and realized that you can get quite far if you do really, really well in your apprenticeship and you make those connections whilst you are based in that placement that you do. To be honest, having an apprenticeship at MS is quite an amazing place to have like a first mm. apprenticeship at. Yeah. So obviously you did the bespoke tailoring. How did that kind of transcend into garment technology? Like what was the Yeah, so my my apprenticeship was actually within the menswear department at head office. Okay. So I worked in the denim department and the tailoring department, which kind of fits in well with my bespoke tailoring experience. So I really, really loved it. Um and one thing that was really different was um, it really helped a lot with my previous experience in understanding how suits were made. Um, and that kind of just translated really, really well into the work that I was doing. I guess more of the things that I had to learn was Excel. Um, no, one ever, spreadsheet. <laughs> no one ever tells you how much you need excel for in your adult life you know what's so funny though i feel like now more and more a lot of job ads are saying like highly proficient in microsoft suite and yeah. basically that microsoft suite is not word or powerpoint they yeah mean excel. It's, it's excel it's excel it's, it's always excel i yeah i've run away from buying because i've seen too many spreadsheets like i'm tired of spreadsheets i don't like them anymore i think i think in all kinds of 
I know I don't work in the industry anymore per se, but even in my current role, I still use spreadsheets all the time. So I, I find it quite useful, but it's just incredible how people don't use it enough. Um, designers should learn how to use it too, honestly. That's that's what I think. <laughs> that they should. But you were saying that you get confused for like a designer a lot of the time. So what would you say are like the main differences between a garment technologist and I don't being draw. a designer? I don't draw. That's that's the main difference. You don't draw, but you can draw. I can draw. You can draw really well, actually. I, I can't draw. I, I can draw in my spare time and for to get out of that mindset of work. But I don't draw anything. I don't draw. Yeah. That's a great stress to not have. Yeah. I know how stressful drawing can yeah. be. But the thing is, in terms of, for example, for production, it's not the whole... It's not what you see the, um, in terms of design where you think it's like hawk chill where people are just drawing like little brush lines and it's all pretty and nice and stuff. We have tech packs, flat drawings of how your garment has to look like. What is a tech pack? Tell so us. So a tech pack is basically you will send this to the factory and the more information that you have on it, the better, better they design. can execute your design, your idea, anything like that. I have seen tech packs that were literally a screenshot of a person's dress from Instagram. And I said, what the hell is that? What do you want me to do with it? Um, so a tech pack would usually have like your trim sheet. It would have all the, the fabric sheets, um, your measurements for and all the comments that you've made during your fit sessions so as a garment tech i make sure that that's all in place um and your tech pack also includes front and back diagrams your patterns um where all the stitches would go and even sometimes um on the supplier side of things where i've worked we also include a set of instructions on what things what things you need to do first so that's really yeah handy. just a really just a timeline of how a shirt dress is put together, for example. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. So for those that like, obviously you're not a designer, but for those that like would need someone like you, but necessarily can't afford to have someone mm. like you, how can they go about getting a tech pack made? Because I have people come up to me, not come up to me, but like I have people ask me quite regularly, like, can you help me make a tech pack? And it's like, I know the kind of overview of it, but mm. I'm not the type of person that can draw enough to be able to make a detailed one for you. So the thing is, I, I think with tech packs, you have to realize that it's not just the drawing side of things. It has to be all about the information you put. So this is where Excel comes really handy. Um, so for example, like the measurements, um, you have to put like the the bust, the waist, the hips, the inside leg. Um, yeah, how, how long the garment is. Um, and really, the more you speak with your pattern cutters, so for example, if you're designing something and you decide to dis to make it without ever seeing a sample of it first, then that's where you'll probably fail. Um, I hate pattern cutting. I, I'm so happy I don't design anymore. Yeah, but then with, with a designer, so a designer can have zero experience in sewing or anything like that. But if you can communicate with your pattern cutter and someone that has that experience, then you'll be able to put a tech pack together much better um, and to save yourself some money, some time um on sampling on deliveries on shipping or anything like that because the more time that you spend on it and to be able to communicate it clearly the less mistakes a factory will make in the end yeah okay that that is pretty clear yeah so obviously the bread and butter of kind of getting into the industry is interning would you talk us through your kind of like internship days like how you kind of like stepped it up to get where you are yeah yeah so i mainly interned within tailors um and uh, at the time a lot of them was unpaid internships um i've also been a been able to intern for some higher end brands as well um which is around in dalston like east london area um and yeah at the time it thankfully now if no one knows this uh it's illegal for for you to be an unpaid intern really yeah so when people are constantly like yeah you can intern for free say no say no um because it is illegal um 
I did so many unpaid internships. I never knew that. Well, maybe when I was doing them, they weren't free, but. Yeah, so unpaid internships are illegal. Um, make sure to be paid because that is your time and that is your energy. And yeah, the, it, it needs to be a transaction. Um, but yeah, I, I did I did a few unpaid internships, but only for like a couple of hours or so. And that doesn't make it any better um, now that I think about it. But it's, yeah, it's at the time I was just really thankful for the opportunity. Yeah. And I guess that's what happens when you're quite young. That's the transaction though. Yeah. You? Like they're giving you the opportunity and they're giving you like the, the time to yeah. learn from them. Yeah, but then also it's it's exploitative. Yeah. It's so, close, yeah, yeah they're, they're exploiting the fact that you are coming in for free and are willing to work for free yeah. um, in exchange of knowledge. And yeah, I, I, I personally don't think that's right. Um, but I, and I think in the fashion industry, it is quite toxic where they are like, yeah, you know, you can, you can make it through all the internships that you do. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't really intern for very long, mainly because I found my apprenticeship quite quickly. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, whilst I was doing the course, I was working a retail job, so I didn't really feel the need to intern mm -hmm. as much. Yeah. All I did was intern just to make those uh, connections within Savile Row. Um, so I did a couple of hours here and there with people. So for example, Geeves and Hawks, um, which is a really, really big tailors at Savile Row. Um, and then I did a few tailoring internships with other tailors in Islington. So, you know, your local tailors, um, but they were really, really good. Um, yeah, and I really enjoyed what I learned from them. But at the same time, I still had to move on because, yeah, when when you're when you don't have that privilege of being able to work for free for so long, yeah, yeah. you need to be able to support yourself. And so even though I was being paid three pounds fifty an hour as an apprentice, I was still able to have an income where it would support me at the time. Um, yeah, so it helped that I lived with my parents, but also it helped that. I was able to do something where I could learn in a really, really big corporate office at yeah. the same time. So when did it kind of click that garment technology was what you wanted to do? Because obviously, you know, you did the bespoke tailoring. Mm. Like when did that garment technology is like the sole thing I, click? I think, I think it was during the time when I went into all my fit sessions and I realized I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and then doing all those comments and, seeing the next sample come in and it was like yeah ready to go so ready to go into production that's that's when I knew that I really enjoyed it and that I was good at it yeah because you know it is I have like in this like fashion industry obviously you see like the designers are glorified you know they're stylists on Instagram all over the place there's mm -hmm. like buyers that are telling that and like six figures you know there's a lot of a lot of fast high pace high high highly desirable jobs like where, where did it come into play that you knew that garment technology that wasn't as popular as everything could be a fulfilling career kind of thing? I think you can, so with regards to it, I think you can, you can go everywhere around the world with garment technology. So you can decide to be a garment tech for factories across the world, um, even brands across the world as well. Um, so yeah, I've I've had I've been able to have the opportunity to um, do some stuff in Spain because of it, and you know, as a garment tech, you are really really responsible for looking after the quality of a product. So they will send you to factories, they will send you to Turkey, they will send you to um, Vietnam, they will send you free to. Free holiday. Uh, I wish. Um, oh. I mean, it's a working holiday, I guess. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, you you get to see the world with it. And you get to visit all these trade shows, for example, with your fabric techs. Um, so the big one is Premier Vision in Paris, yeah. which um, is really, really great. Or even more technical textiles. So there, there's, um, sorry, there's, um, yeah, there's trade shows within Shanghai or uh, Germany that deals with innovative textiles. Um, so it's really, really exciting. And if if it's, you can change the course of 
the focus of what brands would like to do because of that. So you have, you know, quite influence. So in terms of now where sustainability is a big thing, as a garment tech, you can say, why are we doing all of these things that waste a lot of energy, that creates a lot of waste? So for example, sampling could take, what, six, six weeks to do and you have three samples or so. And even that takes a lot of energy for something to come over from China and for them to cut and make it. it it's, it's a lot of fabric. It's a lot of energy. It's a lot of time wasted. Yeah. So as garment techs, we innovate um, how the whole production process goes. Yeah. And really it's, it to me, the money doesn't really matter too much, mainly because the higher and senior, yeah, the yeah. more senior you get, the higher your pay is anyway. Yeah. So you are on that same level as buyers or like, yeah, heads of tech and things like that. I mean, what I remember as a BAA, so like a buying admin assistant, you don't get paid that much. But as a garment tech, you get, so at the time, the starting salary was around 20K, whereas for a buying admin assistant it would normally be at the pits which was like 18k and that was the standard yeah it may have changed now but when you my my top tip is always to add 2k plus and just be like hey i i know i earn 20k but i actually earn 22 yeah and then keep going up and up and up and up so also on just as a note as well Brands don't pay that much, mainly because they know that there will always be someone waiting to take your job. Whereas suppliers, they know that if you're good, they're going to keep you on for a while. Yeah. Um, mainly because you have to have that client relationship. Um, yeah. So. so you're constantly in close proximity, like with clothes. What's that like? Do you like it? Do you love it? I love clothes. I think always being around garments and touching them would be kind of really fun for me. <laughs> I think I think for me it's more of the problem solving behind it. Um, with clothes, I've actually not bought any for quite some time. Mainly oh my just gosh. yeah, mainly just because I I just think it's crazy how how I think in the age of the influencer you are more prone to consume more than you need to. Yeah. So with this whole newness thing, everyone's like, yeah, I need to get the newest thing possible. And really I've I've kind of seen how much work it takes for someone to create just even one sample. So I see my machinists quite regularly. Yeah. I when I worked for suppliers, my machinists were right just next door. And they would take 8 hours to make an a dress or a shirt for me. And I would say, look, you know what? I I shouldn't be contributing to this because who needs another leopard print shirt or a leopard print shirt dress or even another leopard print pajama? So it's like there's enough leopard print out there. There's enough shirts out there. There is enough. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's kind of why I slowly, slowly stepped away from it, mainly because there's just yeah, the world is dying. We don't need another sequin dress. Fair enough. Completely understandable. Obviously, it's a lot to follow a garment on its entire journey because as a garment technologist, that's kind of what you do. You're saying you're watching your machinist make something for eight hours. But how how are you ever tired of clothes? Like, if your whole passion is clothing, how did you become tired of it? Well, mainly because I think the whole pressure of being able to deliver to deadlines that don't really matter so for example there's this whole when when the fashion week calendar was followed quite strictly you never stop you always have to constantly think of the next thing mm -hmm. and where does it end you know it's like a never think, ending cycle yeah yeah and and you know there's there's nothing ever really new out there everything is always recycled there's not it's not like we're gonna innovate the mini skirt <laughs> it's not like we're gonna innovate the you know. Don't say that, actually. Attica did something recently. Have you seen that, like, rhinestone thing they did with the yeah, green, green gems on it? And oh, it's wow. Black. Innovative. <laughs> Just, wow, incredible. Oh, I'm going to put fur on the on the hem or something. <laughs> Just, it's never been, been done before. So it's it's yeah. like, it's like what, what else do you need another resort show for when you're going to do another straw bag? You know, it's, it's yeah, I, I don't, I don't, 
anything that's innovative is just, for example, like recycled fibers being made into trainers or things like that. And not many people do that because people react so quickly to things. Yeah. You know, this whole, yeah, the, there's nothing, everything just becomes old news really quickly. Yeah. And yeah, so for example, ASOS would put out a thousand, well, more than a thousand items, new products per day. How do you have the capacity to look through them all? It's true. It, it, does, it, get, it does get a bit tedious, like online shopping and things yeah. like that. And then... On the next day, you have another thousand products. Yeah. So really, how much can a consumer take? Fair enough. So obviously, you've been here for quite a while. And obviously, like, you've had different, like, parts to your journey. Yeah. But what would your, what would a day in the life of a garment technologist be like? What would it look like? I would say the best way to describe it is a week. Um, so <laughs> Not even a day, a week. Yeah, no. A day in your life would be like, oh, maybe I've finally caught up on emails. Um, but a typical week would be you would have either a fit session on a Tuesday and a Thursday and you spend the next day writing up your fit comments for the factory to look at. Um, so you would send feedback to your uh, factories and be like, hey, you did this really well or you did this terribly, start it again. Um, Is it that harsh? Yeah, yeah, sometimes because you have a lot of factories that will be set in their ways in making things and mm. you want them to change their way of doing things yeah and yeah sometimes you have to have make those really really hard phone calls um or sometimes you get a really really badly performing garment so jeans was quite a hard one we always got emails about um the dye in jeans um staining white leather seats and my usual comeback would be like why did you wear blue jeans on white leather seats but hey you know the, yeah. it's it happens like that like the dye would transfer off or something and i would have to figure out a way to solve it for the next um launch or the next drop or something like that and yeah, your typical week is just a week of problem solving. Um, anything could happen. So, for example, a shipment would be delayed and then you'd be like, okay, do I really need another sample or can I just make more comments on the last sample and send that off and hope for the best? You know, it's it's a lot of assessing risk. Um, yeah, so that's, that's typ a typical week. Okay, so that's a great lead on to my next question. What skills do you feel are like essential to have in being a good garment technologist? Um, actually, knowing how to sew and put clothes together. So pattern cutting is a really, really big one. Ill, um, sorry. <laughs> yeah, mainly because you will get some funky looking clothes sitting on a person and you have to realize, so why is this person's thighs so like squished in and you need to figure out where to let things out and how it affects the proportion of it you actually taught me how to pattern cut what was it um two centimeters from the from the hem what was it that you used to say you say you have to go two centimeters up or was it two centimeters downwards like you have to cut two centimeters away from the oh for your seam allowance yeah <laughs> yeah so without seam allowance you will not have any space for that seam to go so yeah it's it's really important you can't just cut it as close to the body as possible just because if you need to let it out or if you need to finish it in a way yeah, yeah you need that space to be able to do it look at me remembering that look i remember things from this I wow remember. check you out <laughs> so obviously like a lot of roles have like junior senior then you have like the midweight would you call it like a midweight role what's career progression like within the garment technology mm -hmm. sphere some careers nothing really ever moves and you mm -hmm. have to kind of leave every time to move mm -hmm. on to another thing mm -hmm. but what's it like within the garment technology sphere so it pretty much follows like an admin assistant so it starts off as a technical admin assistant and then you could go into a junior um junior garment tech role um and then after that you go into your midweight, just general garment tech role. Um, and then at this point, when you are quite settled in within your garment technology role and you feel like you want to try something new, then you can also try product development or fabric technology. Um, with product development, it is pretty similar to, um, it is pretty similar to garment tech, but then you think more about the trims and how to develop that within factories and how to cost things. So that that is quite different in that sense. And then fabric technology, instead of looking at the entire garment 
in its entirety, you look at the fabric yeah. and you just think about the weave and the weft and all of these crazy things like thread count. And you're just like, why do I need to know that? But yeah, so so they're exciting. Um, fabric technology is really all about testing. So for example, is it fireproof? Is it waterproof? Is it is it actually what I'm going to say it is? That must be fun. It is quite fun, but I don't want to remember all the things that they need to remember. So yeah, I, I yeah, I tried and I will stick to my garments. Um, so bigger companies will be able to have those roles. So for example, a garment tech and a fabric tech. And other times, if it's a smaller company, you will just be the garment tech and the fabric tech all one. in one. Yeah. Um, so it's it's quite a, va a varied role. And then once you are more experienced and things like that, you can become the department manager or the senior tech or the head of technology. Oh. So there is quite a lot of progression uh, within that. Yeah, so um, that means there's longevity in this career as well. Yeah, right? yeah. So there are other roles as well now that it's coming up. Within fabric technology and within all that testing, you can become a sustainability assistant and then move your way up into like head of sustainability. Um, just because it is a really, really big part of um, the industry where people are really focusing on it now. Um, with Selfridges having the Project Earth campaign, that is really, really important. And that brings a light into all of these um, new roles that are available. Um, yeah, you could also become go into the supplier side and it is pretty much the same. So you become junior tech, uh, garment tech. You can even go into more um, senior roles within factories and you could be a garment tech for that side where you liaise with the garment techs from the retailers so you can do it anywhere wow so many career choices there yeah i'm just that one question so that's great mm. okay so obviously there is such a taboo around talking about pay but i kind of want to like take that stigma away like i feel like people should know kind of what they deserve yeah. what are that you kind of touched on it briefly like yeah. some people start like 18k 20k mm. but what are salaries like within the garment technology sphere so I would say when you're starting off, and I'm not too sure because this this would be from around 2016 time, but you, when you're starting off, you would normally be typically given 18 to 20K. Yeah. Uh, as a junior tech, you can maybe bring it up to 23 to 25. And then into that mid weight, you just go into 30. 31 32 and then the more senior that you get you can ask for 40 45 and then head tech you would do whatever you want and ask for any silly money you can get yeah because you know i think it's just people don't understand how important you guys are to the whole thing like without you guys there would be no yeah so essentially when you're negotiating all of these things it is important to remember how many you products you look at every like month or so or season or so um or how many clients you have so for example if you are a um if you work in the supplier side you could supply for asos you could supply for river island you could supply for uh mns for example and if you have these big guys as your clients you say look i manage all of these relationships and they still keep buying more because they like the product that we Produce. produce and who is that down to ahem me so give me more that money girl. yeah you know that, give me that's more money. yeah you're like give me my money but um that's yeah that's how you leverage it and i think some people are really really scared of you know hyping themselves up yeah like, but you really have to like be proud of your achievements yeah i'll be real like you know people would look at like glass store and like indeed i love glass door do you yeah i don't think it's a correct like interpretation of what you can get paid because i didn't know you guys got paid that much like but i think also it it's i i hate the terms like competitive salary on a job description and i will literally call up whoever like put it out and be like how much is that paying because am i bothered to go through this entire job application process if you're gonna in the end tell me so um, bigger companies love to do this but they will go make you go through an entire three-stage presentation interview and then be like by the way our budget is like 23 to 25k and then you're like 
why did I go through this? Yeah, it you know? is really tedious, like the whole hiring process. That's yeah. why I was talking to a friend about it the other day and we were saying that like some jobs should just start saying the pay because it's not like mm. you're not going to get any applicants, but you just, you, you cut a lot of the, the BS per se. Mm, you yeah. can just let people yeah. kind of move on. Yeah. And, and also um, with, yeah, so certain apps, so for example, like a tech app called Otter have started to, you know, they only would advertise if you say, what the salary is so a lot of places need to start doing that because you know there are graduates out there who need break and you know how many applications they make and you even for the hiring team they have to sit through all of that and be like oh my god I can't keep doing this yeah but bringing it back to like the technicalities of your work obviously we briefly spoke about pattern cutting is that something you feel like is essential to like know how to do being a garment technologist or you could you get away with um not. absolutely you need to pattern cut yeah that, um, that job's not in the sphere for me sadly yeah so yeah i mean there are some so for example like i said to you there are jobs in within the fashion industry where you don't actually need to be super super creative yeah but know, um yeah and and also it doesn't necessarily ha have to be you know the most fashionable I mean, you can you can make a career in the industry as a lawyer. You can make a, a career in the industry as someone that just really knows their their stuff about legislation and shipping costs and things like that. So, yeah, um, here as a garment tech, you definitely need to know how to pattern cut or at least understand when a pattern is laid in front of you, that there's something wrong. So for example, if it's meant to be a high waist, high waisted jean, why is the waist super, super low and close to the crotch? You know, things like that. So yeah, you have to be able to look at it and be like, um, that looks wrong. Yeah, that makes sense. Like knowing your stuff and like, yeah. they, well, they pay you to know your stuff, I guess. Yeah, so. exactly, that's, that's it. But I'm gonna call you out. You're like, you hate Fashion Week. You don't like Fashion Week. How how does how does one not like fashion week like, i think i've touched on this in regards to the whole cycle of it yeah. so previously where i said that then there's nothing ever new and yeah I, I i stand by that i completely stand by that um so for example mimi have brought back their like mini mini pleated skirt okay i love that skirt yeah <coughs> so i mean that's come around before um and yeah it's it's things like that you know you get you get inspiration from the 60s you get inspiration from the 70s you get inspiration from the 90s and then you get what happens after that you know you just go back through it again so yeah, yeah. so you like you find there's a lack of originality in the whole space i don't think it's more of a lack of originality i think it's just more there's no need to waste people's time <laughs> yeah. I'm all for efficiency, I would say. I think I think the I think a lot of graduates or anyone who is studying fashion have loads of ideas. Unfortunately, they're not supported into bringing those ideas into life. life yeah. So, unfortunately, a lot of the bigger designers would be able to just, you know, say, "Oops, that's my idea." Yeah. Um and then Fashion Week, I mean, in regards to the pandemic, we've had a quiet break designers were able to take a break and actually foster that creativity but now we're rushing them back into having that fashion week calendar i think it's pardon my french but bullshit <laughs> yeah makes sense so a lot of the time in your career like obviously you've had to like follow the journey when fashion week comes obviously like everything the turnout is like crazy that like, you have to be really on it like you have to be making sure those garments are ready for when they touch the runway have you ever like struggled with having a work-life balance because i feel like there's a lot of hush in terms of like the mental health that comes with a lot of these jobs like when the turnover is needed like tomorrow they're saying this needs to be done you work nine to six you can't get out by six if the run is at two tomorrow like so how did that come in i think in terms of garment technology we are not really necessarily involved within fashion week and things like that um unless you work for a brand or a designer that is showing in fashion week then yeah you would absolutely be I mean, your deadlines would be for production. So the production of the garments. So if if someone's design was going to Selfridges, for example, then that's when we would come in. Um, we don't necessarily care about, you know, the actual... It's it's not like, you know, fa um, what what's that show? Um, 
What's that show? Um, but it's what? What is it? Like, what are you trying to gauge at? Tyra Banks. America's Next Top Model. Mm, the other one. Uh, something Runway. Oh, Project Runway. Project Runway. That's it. That's Love that it. shit. That's great. Yeah. Show. It's not like that where someone is stitching someone into like their their dress at the very last minute and going, go, 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 go. You know, it's, it's nothing like that. It's more just, um, yeah, we have deadlines, but it's more to make sure things are in store. So that's, that's where we come in. Um, in terms of, you know, the work-life balance, I think it's being able to set your boundaries. Yeah. So I switch off at six. Me too. Major. Like Me too. I, I, I've, I've made it very clear from the very beginning that I don't get paid after six. So yeah, there's, yeah. there's no, there's no reason why I should be busting my ass for that. Yeah. Um, the, and it's also important. I once had a very, very tough chat with my suppliers um, where they found myself on my personal Instagram to DM me on Christmas day. Bottom. Yes. On Christmas day to ask for my fit comments um, because they needed to make that sample for their deadlines. And I said, I don't think you understand this is a public holiday and do not contact me through personal social media ever again, or else I will have to actually, first of all, raise a complaint. And second of all, I may not have to work with you. Yeah. So yeah, setting your boundaries is super, super important. Yeah. Well, this is definitely an interesting take onto like the whole fashion weekend, like producing clothes kind of thing, which I feel like is a good lead into my Drabble Fab feature. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of changing up what the Drabble Fab feature is. So if you're new to the podcast, Drabble Fab is my special feature that I do on the show with every single one of my guests. And if you're like old to the show, we're kind of changing it. So like, listen up. So we're going to do it based on things that we are seeing within the fashion industry, within fashion in general, that we're loving at the moment and that we're kind of hating. So obviously the fabulous will be, the fab of it will be the things that we're finding fabulous. The drab of it will be like the things we're finding drastic, let's say. So like pun mm. intended. But Melissa, what are you loving within the fashion sphere right now? Uh, ooh, so can can I shout out some favorite designers? Of course, go ahead. Okay, so I am loving Bianca Saunders at the moment. I switched uh, him for a Pharrell. Yeah. I'm loving it so much. Respect yeah, to her she's, she's, cool. she's, she's really, really cool. Um, And yeah, I mean, I love tailoring. So of course I love her stuff. Um, I am also loving Grace Wells Bonner. Um, mm -hmm. So she is a wonderful, wonderful designer who has actually also been a fad Fashion Futures alumni. And she's huge. She's done a great um, Adidas collaboration. And she's some of her items are currently at Tate Britain right now for the Life Between the Islands That's um, exhibition. So she's she's a really, really great designer. Um, and also another, yeah, I, I love I love so many different designers at the moment. Um, but yeah, those are two that I currently really enjoy seeing. But what clothes are you kind of loving? Even though you're not buying clothes per se, like what are you loving that you're kind of seeing? Ooh, what am I loving that I'm seeing? Mm. Oh, I just love any dresses with pockets. Ooh. That's that's really important. I think You're wearing a dress with a pocket right now. Yes, I am great, wearing actually. a dress with a pocket right now because pockets are important. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually it's a really cute dress. I really Thank like you. it. Where is it from? It is from Uniqlo. Oh, great brand. Great brand. I've worked with Uniqlo before. I think for me, I'm loving trench coats right now because they're slowly coming back. Like we're getting like the warmer weather. So it's like, sometimes you do need a jacket, but sometimes you don't. Mm. So it's like I'm kind of obsessing over a trench right now. Yeah. But what are you hating? Like what are you hating within the industry, within the fashion sphere that's like, you feel like can go? If it went tomorrow, you would not be sad. Oh, okay. So within the industry, unpaid internships can go. Uh, within the actual fashion sphere, skinny jeans. Pardon? Skinny jeans can go. Jeans were never meant to have stretch in them. Well, not in that sense where it's like, you know, jeggings. Oh, yeah. oh I hate those. Oh, they need to. Uh, I haven't seen them in a really long time. Yeah, but thank like, goodness. Because like, I'm, I'm just loving the fact that, you know, like mom jeans. My and favorite like, style jeans. And then, yeah, like looser fit jeans. Like boyfriends back. and stuff like that. Yeah. So I, I'm really, really enjoying that because these thighs are not going to fit into skinny <laughs> jeans anymore. <laughs> Thick girl problems. Um, I'd say for me, cargos need to go. 
Cargo's need to go. Car- I hate. Well, car- I hate streetwear in general. Like I just don't like the whole back. I but like I things- feel like what you're wearing right now is quite streetwear. I'm wearing a jumpsuit and a jacket. Yeah, but I feel like the jumpsuit is quite like, you know, with the outfit that you've put together, that could be considered streetwear. Okay, maybe I should say baggy thing streetwear like i don't like all the baggy trousers that are just like not sitting on your pop- like clothes are made if your clothes are made like let them like wear your clothes well do you know what i mean i thought like the cargo thing is like everyone's wearing like really huge trousers and then they'll wear like a really tight top like the contrast just doesn't make I too much sense i actually really love that so i, like I think i think it f- feeds on like you know the whole skateboarding lifestyle with like palace and supreme and like stussy and carhartt and yeah yeah, that that influences culture so Mm -hmm. you know like you get it from like the old 90s hip-hop and things like that so yeah without it i i yeah i think it's i think for me it's worse if it's like a misguided (laughs) outfit so yeah melissa you are being so shady right now (laughs) yeah you know like yeah the the cargo the giant cargo pants are like in nylon or in like super shiny satin that looks really really gross and naff yeah i think that's where i would draw the line well fair enough but it is time for some wise words from you Mm. if you could give some advice to someone wanting to start out within the garment technology sphere what would you give like what would you say um I would say create, create a lot of things, learn a lot of things about how clothes are made. Um, Then that would kind of give you that experience into, you know, whenever you go into a fit session. And then, yeah, just look out for, you know, that you don't always necessarily have to stand out, start out with a brand. Um, You can always start out with smaller suppliers and learn your way through that because then the connections that you make are endless through them. You will be able to have your clients and go, oh, I know that person from like um, ASOS. And then I know that they work with this supplier so I can go to them as well for a job. So yeah, don't don't be afraid to ask. And also, yeah, say no to unpaid internships. (laughs) I love your advocacy for unpaid internships, like not allowing that to be a thing yeah anymore. yeah no no i think i think we've had it for so long that we just need it to end <laughs> yeah fair enough and what is one thing you wish you knew before you kind of got into the industry like what would you wish you known um the um, yeah how how many hours it takes to become you know wise and knowledgeable and things like that but i guess that's the only thing that you can gain from experience yeah Well, that is such amazing advice, Melissa. Thank you so much for coming and talking to me on the Star Report. For those that, like, want to get in contact with you, and obviously you run a huge design, like... Yeah. So you can find me at a space called Poplar Works. Um, And, yeah, I could probably show you for a tour of all the, like, design studios and things like that. Um, Otherwise, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, and you can find me on Instagram at Mel's, so M-E-L-S, Diop, so D I O P. Great. Do you have any potential like work experience things going on at your your design Ooh, building possibly. site? Possibly. So yeah, follow the Poplar Works Instagram. So it's literally P O P L A R W O R K S. Um, yeah, and then I usually post like any job um, adverts on there as well because a lot of my designers definitely need interns, machinists. Um, yeah, anything like that. And we always have events that we need facilitators for. So please get in touch. Well, that's great. Thank you again, Melissa. No and problem. thank you to anyone who has tuned in to the Star Report today. Remember to follow the podcast at the Star Report on all social media platforms. And we will see you soon for the next episode. Love you all. Bye.